Welcome back to Analysis, where we've been discussing the implications of the UK's fleet of drones being redeployed to other theatres when the pullout from Afghanistan is complete. Joining us for this half of the discussion are Paul Schultz, who's visiting professor, a visiting fellow at the Centre for Defence Studies at King's College London. And on the line, we have Professor Geoffrey Backman from the American University School of International Service and Letta Taylor, Senior Researcher in Terrorism and Counterterrorism at the Human Rights Watch. Uh, welcome to the programme. Paul, um, what's the thinking behind this redeployment? Why would they want to do it? Um, they want to have the most flexible, up-to-date um, military support technologies closer to where British forces might be engaged in, in, in strength. And they've been very controversial. So is there, a, is there a political calculation that deployment might be technically advantageous but politically not so much? Well, before any deployment, people think about decision makers, foreign office, cabinet office, defence ministry, think about the politics. But I, I'm not sure they're that um, especially controversial, except amongst small campaigning groups, their use in Afghanistan was entirely within the same kind of rules that apply to manned aircraft in a theater of war that was endorsed by the United Nations. So except for those who really don't like drones for wider ideological or cultural reasons, I, I, I don't accept that they were, they were necessarily demonized. And certainly there, were, there, was a, there was a big concern that they shouldn't be in, mm. in, in the way but, but they, they were presented. But they did very controversial on the ground among, among people, and well, the relatives of people killed by them. Uh, that, that's, a, that's been a major... More than other airstrikes? Because remember, there are airstrikes well, by manned air aircraft, more than heavy artillery strikes or special forces strikes, night raid, more than that? Are you well, sure? It's um, worth noting as well that the, U, the British drones, uh, Britain has acknowledged one mm. incident of civilian casualties. Mm. And um, out of over 300 drone strikes that have been launched, which uh, indicates an exceptional level of accuracy and real care. I mean, you can read the operational updates from the RAF, and it will show you when missiles fired by a drone have been deliberately veered off course because there was a danger that they would hit a civilian building, let mm. alone harm civilians. Mm. So there has been real care on the part of the RAF to really sort of distinguish, um, well, to avoid civilian casualties, and by doing so, to sort of distinguish um, British drones from perhaps drones used in other mm. theatres and in other contexts. Let me bring uh, Letta Taylor in on this. Letta, what, what do you make of that? Do you think they've been, that the, the, they're uncontroversial? I think this is what Paul, Paul's suggesting, that they're uncontroversial except for, you know, people who get wound up about this kind of thing. Well, I think drones are very controversial. I think, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. I think drones are very controversial, uh, certainly in Yemen, which is uh, the country where I've studied them most closely. But I think that's in large part because of the blanket of secrecy that the U.S. casts over the drones program there. And I would contrast that to uh, the um, British and U.S. Uh, more public stances, the NATO more public stance on drones operations in Afghanistan, which is a declared theater of war. Now, if the U.S., uh, if the war winds down in Afghanistan uh, and, the, um, and the U.K. pulls its uh, drones out and deploys them elsewhere, the question is not where these drones will be stationed or even whether they're deployed. It's whether they're deployed uh, in accordance with international law. And, the, and which body of law applies depends on whether there is or is not an armed conflict. But certainly the more transparency there is around the use of armed drones, the less controversial they are. And the more care that countries take to use them in accordance with the law, the less of an outcry there will be. And Geoffrey Backman, what's your take on this? Is this a, has this proved to be controversial uh, other than in small circles of protesters or, uh, or, or not? I mean, I think, uh, I think the use of drones, I mean, I think I, I should clarify you know, it's not just the drones that's the, the question, it's how they're being employed. So, um, you know, for me, it's the targeted killing program and how it's been, you know, how it's <clears throat> the uh, methods and the policy um, more so than the drones. Um, and one point from your first guest, uh, you know, the use of drones in Afghanistan is, is very different than using the drones outside of Afghanistan. So in Pakistan and Yemen, I think you could raise the question, would traditional air force be used in Pakistan and Yemen if drones were not available? And I think the answer would be clearly uh, no to that. Um, and then if you take the question about the uh, controversial nature, I, you know, Am Af I'm sorry, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch both put out recent reports in 2013 questioning the 
uh, conformity to international humanitarian law and international human rights law uh, in the targeted killing program. And then more recently, uh, Human Rights Watch put out the report on how a, fu- how a wedding became a funeral about the attack in Yemen that killed uh, some, some around 12 to 15 members of a wedding convoy. So I think the question of the controversial nature of drones, maybe out, especially outside of the countries that are employing them, uh, it's extremely controversial. And then if you throw in uh, the recent uh, reports by Ben Emerson, the wet three reports uh, on his investigation, clearly there is a lack of consensus on uh, whether drones are being used in conformity with the law. But to clarify, the question was about whether British, the redeployment of British drones was going to be especially controversial. And my comments were about the employment of RAF drones in Af- Afghanistan. We don't, they don't fly into Pakistan. So those questions which are undoubtedly controversial about cross-border ground counterterrorism do not apply to the use of UK drones. So do, do, you, think, uh, do, do you think that the redeployment of, of the UK drones will be affected by the controversial cases of the US deployment of them? Because um, I, I guess the point, say, that Jeffrey was making at the end there is that perhaps we're beginning to see an, an erosion of national sovereignty in the use of, jo- of drones, which, which isn't there with manned aircraft well, in I Pakistan. Well, I doubt it, because UK law and, and the interpretative decisions taken by um, government lawyers have meant that the British drones have not been used outside the boundaries of officially designated theatres of war, UN endorsement. So, so that's not going to change as far as I know. So, Alice, do you think that the, what's happened then is that the controversies that attended the, the US use of drones... Uh, I it, certainly it, think there's been some sort of seepage. I yeah. think that there has been... Um, that drones overall has become... A, the, the, the term drones has become a sort of shorthand for extrajudicial targeted killing mm. Or away from hot battlefields, and that in turn has then infected some of the some of the conversation around around the use of British drones, and that's why you saw the RAF really aim to open up in December when they invited people to Waddington. The Defence Minister Philip Hammond was on hand to sort of really help explain and unpack drones, but at the core of um, the UK's use of drones. They, there is a common factor with the U.S.'s use of drones off away from battlefields, and that is an overall lack of transparency. You know, the, um, the campaign group Drone Wars UK has um, has sort of fought a battle with the MOD, really, aiming to get information on on where and when British drone strikes have taken place. Mm. And um, the UK government has refused to disclose that. It refuses to disclose how many people have been killed overall by drones. Um, it, you know, so there is, there is still this sort of unifying lack of transparency. They have said that there is one incident where civilians have been killed, and that indicates an exceptional rate of accuracy. Mm. But without transparency over the overall context of drone strikes, you know, no, the UNAMA report, the UNAMA report, the um, Afghanistan UN mission in Afghanistan uh, report on civilian casualties, that showed that last year civilian drone deaths had tripled in Afghanistan. Now, are all of those drone deaths down, mm. down to um, down to the US? That's what that's the implication. But the mm. US does, the, but sorry, well, the UK does know. not right. respond. Okay. But, and we but don't let's know. remember the wider context, which is that people are dying, un- unfortunately, but inevitably from manned aircraft strikes from special forces raids, all those other things which are part of a large-scale counterinsurgency campaign like Afghanistan. Yes. And information on all of those is, is difficult and undesirable to provide because it gives you a complete pattern of activities, uh, the way your side is fighting the war. Is it really to be expected that that's to be given? Well, it's I mean, never let, been let's, just, before. let's just come back to Unfortunately, with drones, you do, have a, you do have a paradigm. Let me just come back that to, to this question in a moment because it's an important question. But first of all, I, I just want to ask Letta about, uh, about the because um, that, that visit to RAF Wellington that, uh, that Alice was just referring to, um, Philip Hammond, the Defence Secretary, was asked directly about the redeployment of, uh, of British drones, and he said, um, in reference to the Yemen, and he said, yes, we've got to uh, chase the terrorists wherever they go. Now, that seemed to contradict what the MOD has been saying, that there's no plans to do that. But what would be the use and what would be the purpose of UK drones uh, and, and the likely effect of them being deployed to Yemen if indeed uh, Philip Hammond was right? Well, I think that if the UK does uh, begin to use armed drones in Yemen, uh, which is outside of a declared uh, theater of war, this would be a very slippery legal slope indeed, because uh, the UK has been careful to say that it will not uh, use armed drones outside of a, a, a clear armed conflict situation. 
And uh, if, uh, if it goes into to Yemen uh, with drones, it could be argued that uh, international law of war does not apply and that instead human rights law applies. And the human rights law is much more restrictive in the taking of civilian uh, life uh, and the taking of life in general than, than are the laws of war. And uh, the U.S., uh, we, we could find that the U.K. is... Uh, is violating uh, international law, just as I have found in my two reports, which were just mentioned, on uh, targeted killings in Yemen, that, that the U.S. has violated the law in some cases and appears to have violated the law in others. So it's a very slippery legal slope, slope for the U.K., and I think a very controversial one that the British public would not be happy about. OK, Jeffrey Backman, just let me bring you in on the point that uh, Paul was beginning to raise in the studio here just now. Um, uh, wh why do you think it... I mean, you, you've talked of, of, a, of a kind of slippage in the use of, uh, of drones over, the, over national control of its borders. Um, Letter was talking there kind of about a slippage of use into theatres that aren't declared as theatres of, uh, of war. Um, but, but why do you think it is that there's a reaction over the killings of drones that perhaps there isn't a reaction, as Paul suggests, when they're killed by manned aircraft or by special services raids? Uh, I think one, one component is, uh, in some ways, maybe more a, le a moral question than a legal question or, or ethical use of drones. Um, you know, um, going on to the uh, previous point uh, about um, applying human rights law, um, drones do not give suspects or, or potential targets the ability to, to surrender uh, to turn themselves in, to be, you know, to be detained. Um, and as is said, you know, these lethal operations, if human rights law is the applicable law, must be launched um, without their first, I mean, they must be, there must first be, excuse me, reasonable efforts to detain the target individual. Um, and then there also must then also be, therefore, an effort by the individual who's being targeted to use lethal force or to pose a lethal threat to those trying to detain them before lethal force can be justified. So if international human rights law is applied, drones totally remove uh, like entire steps in terms of international law before getting to the point where lethal force can be considered a last resort or justified. Um, certainly the question of sovereignty is another one. Um, you know, borders, I think, are becoming uh, even more, I mean, sorry, even less um, sort of rigid, if you will, um, because drones are being used in, I mean, at the moment, allegedly from consent of all the parties in which the states in which they're being operated. But Emerson you know, recently said that, I think it was in an interview with The Guardian, that in terms of Pakistan, whatever cooperation there may still be at in intelligence level, none of that makes a difference when, as a matter of international law, Pakistan does not consent to armed drones in territories. I think the United States especially has reserved a right to use drones over any, to any territory where it believes a suspected uh, terrorist is located, um, while we've, again, restricted ourselves to territories where, again, we're, we, we claim we have the consent of the parties, uh, we at the same time reserve the right to use drones over any territory. Uh, and so I think one of the things that uh, a number of the rapporteurs have said is we're getting to a point where we are no longer in like a perpetual uh, hot war state, but uh, but perpetual low-level conflict, uh, where drones and other uh, special ops can be used um, continuously as sort of low level of conflict, and that's um, that's a very dangerous thing, I think, especially for the civilians impacted. Okay, Paul. So, I mean, there's a number of different cases involved there, and you were making the point before we came on air that we have to distinguish between the battlefield, so to say, use of them and targeted killings. But let's let's just stay with the targeted killings for 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 a moment. That it has introduced into the situation a kind of extrajudicial um, assassination, hasn't it? Which simply wasn't there before that technology existed, or or, or would have been m much more difficult to carry out. Would have been done by people, killers on, yeah. on the ground, lo locally hired assassins or, or, or special forces team brought in. But I think it's worth emphasizing that I, the American, even the American announced rules are more restrictive than we, we heard. It, it, it is my understanding the Americans are not claiming the right to go and use drones anywhere at any time. They're saying that as part of a global war on terror, which, which is a response to the war that was declared on them, they will go after those planning, those involved in act, acts of violence against the US or US interests um, in places where the country concerned either consents 
or is not in effective control of its own territory or is not willing to do anything about the, the terrorist groups, as the Taliban government was not to do, willing to do anything about al-Qaeda. So it isn't, um, it isn't all of the world. It is small, dangerous areas of the world. And the point that needs to be asked uh, is, well, if that's not to be done, then what is to be done? Uh, is it, uh, Obama got elected openly, clearly, by saying no safe havens. The US does not accept that there can exist safe havens in the world where terrorists can base themselves and prepare attacks. And if you were not to do drone attacks on uh, the Federal Trust territories or, or the more dangerous bits of Yemen, what, in fact, could, could be done at all? Mm. And if the answer is nothing, is that a better state of affairs? Uh, Lata, what is your response to that? Yes, well, first, um, one of the dangers of the Obama administration policy is that uh, the U.S. is not, it said, it, yes, it's only going after those who pose an imminent, armed, armed militants who pose an imminent threat to the U.S., but apart from al-Qaeda and the Taliban, it has not named any, specifically named any of these groups, uh, except unofficially a few of them, such as al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, but it has not released an official list of these so-called associated forces that it says it has authority to go after, nor is it named the pockets uh, or regions or countries where it says it has uh, authority to go after these unnamed groups. So while in theory it's saying we're only going after designated individuals or groups in designated areas, it has not named the individuals, the groups, or the areas. And so really uh, this is a war without boundaries. And um, at the same time, the U.S. is not saying how many people it's killed, how many of them are civilians, under what circumstances, nor has it specified what it means by an imminent threat to the U.S., which is another way it claims authority for these strikes. It appears to be using an extremely elastic definition of, of imminence, as best we can tell. Uh, and so really, um, there are very few limits, as best we can tell, on what the U.S. is doing. We believe it's operating in uh, an accountability vacuum. And this is why we're calling for more transparency, not divulging state secrets, of course, but basic transparency on who it's killing and why, what it's doing when strikes go wrong, and what kind of amends it's offering to victims of unlawful strikes. So, Alice, it, can, can there be a higher degree of transparency, or would that endanger operations, which I think was Paul's um, suggestion? There could certainly be a higher level of transparency. I mean, drone strikes have been going on now in Yemen. Um, the first drone strike was in um, 2002, and then there was the, a big gap until before they started again in 2011. In Pakistan, drone strikes have been happening since 2004. So there's certainly scope for disclosing, even if you're not disclosing up to the minute, Contemporary, contemporaneous information, there is a case to be made for disclosing maybe some older information. And that, that on its own would help to increase the transparency. And that would give us some kind of guidance as to um, how the how how accurate, how accurate reports are, how the, how accurate open source reports are in comparison to, to military reports. Instead, what happens is the US has said time and time again even when multiple sources are credibly claiming that there have been civilian casualties, they've said no, there have been fewer than, fewer than uh, 50, I believe, or um, typically single digits in every year. But we don't get any detail that we can compare it to. Um, what the Yemen has produced was about a, dr a drone strike that a um, wedding convoy, a convoy vehicle leading to a wedding. Uh, now, Human Rights Watch and numerous other organisations have done very prompt investigations, very thorough investigations, and they found evidence of multiple civilian casualties. The US has, says it has also investigated, but they've said, nope, everybody there was al-Qaeda. But there's been no... Because, it, because there's nothing public about it, you can't compare, you can't, you can't mm. cross-match. I mean, Paul, there is a problem here, isn't it? That, that there are, that this isn't the only documented occasion when the, uh, the official sources are saying, oh, no, it's perfectly all right, and, uh, and on the ground there's a you know, dead wedding party. Well, there is certainly a problem. There are, there are, there's a clash of principles here, and it's been conducted in places which are very difficult and dangerous to, to investigate. So we're, we're into almost mystical judgment about is that dead person um, an al-Qaeda sympathizer, an, an active participant, a, an al-Qaeda supporter, or simply related to an al-Qaeda al al person who's been killed in the next door truck? 
making those judgments is not a neat statistical um, matter. I'm not saying it couldn't be improved, but I am saying it is always going to be very difficult. And it's difficult partly because it's not just about what's known from the air. Um, it, it is widely reported that the American campaign in um, drone campaign in Pakistan has become more effective, and it is apparently pretty effective, because of informers on the ground, um, and, and a human network of um, uh, targeters or people who even put infrared homing mm. uh, beacons on, on in, 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 in certain houses and, and compounds. So to begin to talk about that uh, and to open up how you were actually coming to these conclusions is going to involve extraordinarily sensitive uh, information in, implying the knowledge of certain people who can then be hunted down. So it begins to disclose a whole integrated intelligence network of local informers as, as well as air surveillance. And that's beginning to lose the campaign, isn't it? Mm. Jeffrey, I mean, we bring you back on this. Do you, th do you think that there, that there can be, can we ever get to a point where this is a, a sufficiently kind of, to use an absurd phrase, a clean killing uh, machine? Or, 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 or in any case, is there always a, a broader political framework which would determine how people react to these things that is outside to the technical specifications of the weapon used? Uh, I mean, one of the things that I think complicates uh, a perfect you know, clean killing machine or whatever it would be, uh, you know, some of this, as just mentioned, is based on intelligence on the ground. Now, uh, I mean, as far as I understand, um, sometimes this intelligence is not, first of all, accurate. Uh, second of all, actually motivated by trying to actually get uh, potential terrorists, but actually um, to uh, carry out rivalries between different factions. Um, so if we are using human intelligence in that way, uh, I don't know if we can say that that will ever be 100% accurate. Um, but I think another thing that needs to be included in the conversation is uh, the actual methods that are being used in the targeted killing program. So, uh, you know, humanitarian law requires that... Um, the principle of distinction be satisfied between combatants and non-combatants, and that non-combatants be, or I'm sorry, when in question, uh, err on the side of recognizing individuals as non-combatants instead of combatants. Uh, you know, President Obama has authorized signature strikes in both Pakistan and Yemen, which are, are based on behavioral characteristics. Uh, it is not necessarily confirmed that, in, that individuals or groups of individuals target are actually um, participating in hostilities. It's based on what they perceive to be the actions of those who would potentially participate. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you there, Jeffrey. I just want to get one last question, one last response from uh, from Letter. Uh, do you think that there are certain types of weapon, perhaps gas, which, all right, it kills people the same as any other weapon kills people, but it's essentially become um, uh, unusable uh, because of the sort of uh, reaction to, it, to its use. Do you think this is a weapon that might fall into that category? Uh, no, I don't, actually. And, and um, uh, when used properly, with the proper intelligence and according to the law, drones can strike with precision. They, they do represent the specific challenges because of the ability to make killing as easy as a video game. And that is a very serious challenge indeed. It's a moral, moral and ethical one. Uh, that all nations need to address. But when used properly, drones can strike with precision. Okay, so well, I'm the gonna... issue, at least to me, is not whether drones are used, but whether they're used according to the law. And we have serious questions as to whether they are being used according to the law by the U.S. now. Okay, well, thanks very much for rounding up that debate on the use of drones. I'm sure that we'll be returning to that issue in future editions of analysis, and I hope that you'll be joining us as well. Thanks for watching.